Now, this November, they tell us, is on track for being the warmest on record for some 350 years. Chants become the stuff of cliché. Every time the weather does something odd, we point to climate change as the explanation. But how realistic is that? Tomorrow, the UN's panel on climate change is expected to confirm that it believes man-made emissions are making storms, floods and droughts more likely. Scientists believe they're getting better at working out the effects of man-made climate change and some now want to pinpoint which freak weather events are caused by global warming and which aren't. Our science editor, Susan Watts, reports. It's one of the hottest topics in climate science. Can humans be deemed to blame for extreme weather events, such as last year's heat wave in Russia or the floods that have hit the UK in recent decades? And whenever we hear news of people who've lost their lives or their homes after a disastrous weather event, a flood, a hurricane or fires from heat waves, it's the question that sooner or later everyone asks, was it climate change or not? As London basks in a glorious mild autumn, November looks set to be one of the warmest on record. It's not an extreme weather event, but it is unusual. So to what extent can we pin this on human-induced climate change? We've got this unique record in the United Kingdom, the Central England temperature record that goes back to the 17th century. And so we can see that there's been a general warming in Central England temperature of about a degree Celsius. And we can relate that to the increasing odds of something like a mild autumn. And when we do that, you know, we can see, we can make the inference that, yes, it does look likely that the, uh, there's an increased chance of having a very mild autumn. Heat waves like Europe's in 2003 and Russia's last year have increased since 1950. They're now expected to occur roughly once every 20 years instead of once a century. Scientists are increasingly confident these are made more likely by human-induced climate change. Extreme rainfall and floods, like those in the UK in recent decades, and droughts in the tropics and subtropics, have become more common since the 50s and 70s, respectively. On both, local land shape and conditions make it less clear-cut for scientists to link these to human activities. Storms are the most difficult to attribute directly to people because they involve complicated wind patterns. So is it time to call in the lawyers? Some feel there's potential here for legal action against energy companies over damage caused by extreme weather. There is litigation in these states. It's had a chequered history. My own view is that in this country, in Europe, it's not a realistic prospect in the short-term future. But if we get a failure to have international regulation, and if there's a continued large-scale emission by uh, groups of companies in the knowledge of the likely consequence, I think it's very possible in the medium or longer term. The scientific debate over the Russian fires shows how views on the impact of human activities can differ. One paper from America concluded that the record-breaking temperatures were due mainly to natural variability, a stationary high-pressure system. But in October, a second study from Germany concluded that there's an 80% chance that the heat wave would not have occurred without human-induced climate change. And some scientists think it's the interplay between the two where the real answers lie. Tomorrow's IPCC report is expected to say that for the next two or three decades there's still a lot of uncertainty, that the effects that all of us are having will still be relatively small compared with natural climate variability. But if we carry on behaving as we are, as the century progresses, the expectation is that the human effects will be easier to spot. Because of our understanding in terms of the, how the general climate system is changing, we can start to develop reliable results about how our risk to extreme climate change has changed even before that signal has emerged so clearly that it's totally and utterly indisputable. But some climate scientists are unhappy with this approach. Different climate models produce uh, different results. Secondly, it focuses on the meteorological hazard, so for example the uh, heat wave, uh, or the extreme rainfall, rather than focusing on the damages uh, for example, lives lost or uh, costs in pounds. 
Such critics fear that if attribution like this goes ahead, funding won't reach the poor. This methodology suggests we should be funding the human-induced part of things, uh, whereas in fact societies across the world are being exposed to both human and natural occurring extreme weather events. And because of that, it would, cr it would create a problem uh, in that it would only fund the, the human-induced part of, of extreme weather events. These scientists ask why bother trying to disentangle human effects from natural variability. Better, they say, to put the effort into making sure people everywhere can adapt to surviving the extreme weather that's coming their way. Susan Watts. Well, uh, with me now are two climate scientists, Miles Allen from Oxford University and Mike Hume of East Anglia University, who joins us from Norwich. Welcome to you both. Uh, Professor Allen, are you able to say with more clarity now whether extreme uh, weather events are caused by climate change and, and would you allocate resources as a result of what you know? Well, a crucial point to understand about when we talk about extreme weather being caused by climate change, we're not seeing weather events that simply could not have happened without climate change. A good analogy is given by this, this dice. If I roll a dice here and I get a five, I roll it again, I get... It's not working. It never works That's live, fantastic, does it? That's fantastic, because we have to great. tell our viewers, this is a okay. loaded dice, here's, which here's, is not working okay. to its and loaded it's potential. Now, <laughs> it's now coming up sixes, OK? Let's leave it on the six. It's not... Anyway, um, we, we, are, um, we're, we are trying to... What we're, what we're doing is quantify the, how much the weather is being biased towards right. um, uh, particular weather events happening. Now, what you saw, if you were counting them, there were three or four sixes in that sequence, okay, yeah. which wasn't particularly impressive, but is actually more than the it's should It's probably have been. accurate, actually. OK, <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's the way it works with the weather. You know, we're seeing... It's not that easy, but we're seeing the, the weather dice being loaded towards certain events happening. Now, do you, do you think your climate science is more accurate than, than the rolling of the dice you've just had? Well, I mean, that's you know, fundamental, the, isn't okay. it? OK. The, the, point, the point we're saying is we're starting to learn how to do this. OK, it's not that... We know exactly how to do it for every weather event in the world. What we can say is for certain weather events, the, the obvious ones, we can start to say how the odds on those weather events have changed. Yeah. And that's what, we can, that's what, that's what this, this new science of probabilistic attribution is all about. OK. Uh, Mike Hume, that, that becomes crucial, doesn't it, to how you allocate resources. If, if you're starting to see the science prove or help to prove uh, that certain extreme weather conditions uh, are as a result of man-made climate change, you have to act on that, don't you? Well, no, I think this is where the problem lies. I mean, I'm, I'm all for developing our scientific understanding of uh, how the climate system works and what the, the human influences on that system are. But I think when people like Miles and some of his colleagues then start saying that this science could really help the allocation of adaptation resources around the world, that's when I get particularly worried. And I, I think what Miles is doing, he's not understanding the, the, the nature of the adaptation process. By trying to suggest that we have uh, what we might call tough luck weather and human weather, and these are two quite separate categories, and we adapt, we need to adapt to the human cause weather, but we don't need to adapt to the tough luck weather. So That's failing to understand that adaptation is actually the same whether it's human caused or not. You're saying the science isn't up to it then, bluntly? I'm saying that it is, it is far too premature to be uh, trailing this as a way of informing adaptation decisions around the world today. What is needed is investment in adaptation to okay. improve the adaptive capacity of those communities that are most at risk from weather extremes. Whether they're human or not is not the issue. <laughs> Miles the Allen, you're okay. not there well, yet. Well, obviously, no, wait, we're, not on, we're not there for every weather event, but if you're living in an African village and you're being affected by storms, it obviously makes sense to invest in defences against those storms. But uh, you know, no, nobody's suggesting that whether or not those, whether or not those storms are caused, uh, increased, the risk of those storms is increased by human influence on climate is immaterial to whether or not you should try and build defences against them, but it may be highly material to who pays the bill. The point is, we've always given resources to poor countries, not very many resources, it, I should add, um, to help them deal with the unfortunate consequences of bad weather. But the point is, but... you're prepared to go to governments on the strength of what you know at this point and say they should be giving more money because of X or Y. We're not saying that. We're saying that people deserve to know. If certain weather events are being made more likely by human influence on climate, it changes the, 
It changes the nature of the question. We used to give money to help people affected by bad weather yep. as a matter of conscience, whereas if it's our actions that are making that weather worse, then it's not just a matter Miles of conscience, Allen, it's a matter of justice. Mike Hume, sorry, that's got to be right, hasn't it? That actually, if we know something, if we are using the science, there is a political responsibility that comes with that. I mean, Mars is, is, is promoting this as a, a way of introducing evidence-based policy into adaptation. Uh, actually, we have very, very well-assessed evidence that we know that weather extremes cause the greatest damage, the greatest loss of life, the greatest dangers to those people who have got least capacity to adapt to those weather risks. That is very clear and unequivocal okay. evidence. And that is what should be driving our adaptation policy, our adaptation funding, uh, not uh, a, a scientific methodology that is still emergent, that is biased towards those weather extremes which happen oh. in middle to high latitudes rather than those weather okay. extremes that happen in the tropics, which is actually where the All adaptation right. funding is Thank most needed. Thank you both needed. very much indeed. Thanks very much for coming in. Appreciate it.